can expect I'm a little too happy about the newcomers we've gotten for Smash Ultimate. For every Piranha Plant, we got a Joker! For every hero, we got Banjo and a Dan Kazooie. Now that we got Terry Gogurt, maybe... Box Boy! I made a video reviewing Banjo-Kazooie already this month, all to cleverly tie to my worshipping altar towards this small, but beloved series. I'd always wanted to talk about Banjo because of it being one of my favorite platformers. Having them in my intro for all these years wasn't just because of the phonetically convenient sound they made. I genuinely think this is one of the best platforming series that kinda got done dirty. So essentially, they were at the top of my impossible character wishlist before I played Persona 5. And after we saw how ridiculous the DLC was getting, I honestly thought there's no way we couldn't get Banjo and Kazooie. In other words, the next character could be a plank with a nail in it and my flight of fancy will still not be interrupted. Ah, well, I think I'm gonna get on the amiibo scalping early. Banjo Kazooie, to many people, felt like a base roster pick. It felt like they've been on the roster arguably since Brawl or Wii U. But why is that the case? They definitely are a DLC character, but it feels like a Nintendo character has made their way back home. And today, we're going to investigate if this was intentional or not. Banjo Kazooie, just like in Smash Bros, were a character that almost weren't. Rare initially was the company behind the Donkey Kong Country series. They're actually the reason the DK we got today looks like this instead of this. Rare was all for helping on Nintendo's properties, but they had some games they were cooking up on their own. And this introduces Banjo-Kazooie, but not really. Banjo-Kazooie started off as Project Dream, an isometric 3D pirate action game being developed with that sweet, <laughs> sweet Nintendo money. It starred a boy named Edison and nope, now it's fantasy themed. Oh, now it's being developed for the N64. Nope, oh, forget the boy, it's a bunny. Just kidding, now it's a bear. Kazooie came when the game started to transition into a 3D platformer, from what I believe was allowing Banjo to have more versatility in the air. And what better way to make him move in the air than to give him wings? Well, the better thing was to give him a backpack with a bird in it that eventually became a character. If I had a nickel every time that happened. Banjo and Kazooie's history reveals just how makeshift they were. And this follows right into how the duo operates. To outsiders of the series, you're like, what's the deal with them? Okay, how do they become friends? Are they secretly lovers? No, no, it's very much a pragmatic relationship. Motivation-wise, uh, Banjo's sister got kidnapped by an evil witch, and then they go to save her, but also they're just fighting the evil witch. And that's it. It kind of reminds me of Looney Tunes, where a lot of the character objectives sort of just come down to because that's the character. Surprisingly though, even though these characters are kind of just molded for gameplay, they have a lot of character behind them. Banjo's the neutral straight bear. He's good-hearted, though kind of stupid. Whereas Kazooie is much more squawky, often giving lip to anything with two eyes. So in this universe, fucking everything. This relationship even radiates off of their official Smash Bros artwork, where Banjo's clumsily falling over looking back at Kazooie. But overall, this series was remembered for its similar gameplay style to Super Mario 64 and Sunshine. But it provided its own spin and unmistakable charm in the form of characters, objectives, music, and overall presentation. The series was most remembered for its debut on the N64 with these two games. Sort of being like Nintendo characters, but not actually. They also had two other games on Nintendo platforms, Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge and Banjo-Pilot for the Game Boy. And Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, I have no opinions on it because I pretend it didn't happen. Oh yeah, and their spiritual successor! No! And Banjo-Kazooie's history with Smash is a lot more than the Gogurt Warrior or Batman villain. In fact, they were actually considered to be included in Melee, except of course by that time they were owned by Microsoft, and that posed more of an issue for them joining the fight than anything. So now that they're here, what do you say? This game is very convenient to talk about because the characters within the game break the fourth wall about abilities and moves you get, referring to them as moves. Very fitting for a series called Know Your Moves. So let us get into them and talk about all the abilities that the Banjo games are known for. Banjo and Kazooie's moves are a real treat for Know Your Moves as a lot of their moves take from the games and reanimate them with the new models and shiny new effects. The last time these moves were in action were the turn of the century after all. And I guess in Grunty's Revenge if you really want to talk about that. And the most taken from Nuts and Bolts was an idle animation. I think it's safe for us not to talk about that game anymore, right? Let's start at their premier smash stage where you get all your moves, Spiral Mountain. The background, the music, and everything about it really iconically represents what the stage was all about in the game. And what better place to start talking about moves than here? where our lovely friend Bottles teaches us all of the moves for the game. But let's jump right into the moves! The jump is exactly as it appeared in Banjo-Kazooie. Kazooie adds an additional jump in the air thanks to the feathery flap, giving the duo three total jumps. Sadly, however, it doesn't let you hover down as it did in the games. The flap flip is also your main method of height in Banjo-Kazooie, a move the two use to do backflips for extra height. Banjo performs it in Smash as his reverse jump, you know, when you initiate a jump in the opposite direction to where you're facing. 
Banjo also has his regular movement taken from Banjo-Kazooie as well. There's his walk and tiptoe, both brought to life with how they looked in Banjo-Kazooie, but given a lot more energy here. Witness his crouch, or rather, let his crouch witness you. Taken straight from the game also has Kazooie poke her head out to check, hey, uh, what the hell's going on here? This little action is done on several in-game occasions, such as in the idol where Kazooie pokes Banjo's head playfully, as well as the spot dodge where she shrieks in agony. Also, one of my favorite animations in the game is Kazooie angrily flying in the opposite direction as Banjo teeters on the ledge. I love it! But how do they attack in Banjo-Kazooie and how is that communicated into Smash Bros? The claw swipe has gotten a graphical overhaul in Smash and really makes it seem more powerful. In the games, it looked like Luigi's dash attack. But this is coupled with the Rat-a-Tat Rap, an aerial move in the game that sticks Kazooie out for three head pecks. But Smash Bros utilizes this in a number of other moves. The jab attack finisher does a rat a tat 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 It also appears in the back air retaining its three peck quality. The dash attack keeps it simple with Banjo's forward roll. And the last of the spiral mountain moves, the beak barge. A forward strike where Banjo pops a whip and Kazooie jabs her neck forward. Typically used to hit switches or break big objects in Banjo Kazooie. Conversely, the beak buster. It's used as their hurtling downward aerial. And aside, I do not know about you guys, but I do not like aerials like this. Ice Climbers, why do they do this to you? Sheik, I could care less, but Toon Link? I love Toon Link, but I do not like using him because of this move. Anyways, in the games this was used as an aerial attack to plummet and destroy stuff from above. So I suppose it fits here and represents the character. Oops, maybe we plummeted from too high. In Banjo, there is fall damage, except unlike in Mario 64, when he falls, he just goes, I am a pizza pie Banjo and Kazooie dramatically hit the ground and really sell that impact. And they do this dramatically, if not more, when knocked by a strong smash attack in Smash, or use Wonder Wing when they're out of golden feathers. Clumsily falling to the ground, look at them. Adorable. Speaking of golden feathers, what a move! Dozens of overpowered god-slaying heroes. Legends that travel through time and space! All felled by a single wiggly feather. This is why I play Super Smash Brothers. Well, golden feathers are one of the three main collectibles in Banjo. Between eggs and regular feathers, they are unmatched. Wonder Wing allows you to temporarily become invulnerable to everything. And it's even required against the final boss fight against Grunty with this one attack that hones in onto you and you just cannot dodge it. You have to use Wonder Wing. But Feathers, while not a usable item in Smash, is a graphical effect whenever you use Kazooie-based attacks, which is derived from Kazooie shedding a feather when you use her flying ability. Finally, the most defining move of the two. Someone call Dr. Mario. Egg firing and the rear egg have roots in Banjo, both showcasing the use of eggs as a forward and rear projectile that can be aimed. Though not very well, but what, could you do better shooting eggs at your- As I was saying, this move is a bit complicated. If you hold down that special button instead of Rattatat tapping it, you can grab Kazooie by her tuchus and begin firing eggs haphazardly. You can walk around and jump too, acting sort of similar to the cracker launcher you cowards added back. This is a reference to the Briegel Blaster stages of Banjo-Tooie, where you'd enter first-person mode and have Banjo hold Kazooie like a bazooki, firing eggs and tackling objectives. There's also the forward tilt, the beak bayonet, that was also used in these sections. Of course, it wouldn't make eggs to not mention the down special in this section. The grenade egg! They act as any old grenade. You know when you poop it out, you only got a select amount of time before it explodes. So that's where Snake gets his from. Speaking of letting off a little weight, Kazooie probably has the most powerful move in all of Banjo-Kazooie. The Talent Trot. Interestingly, in Smash, these two have one of the most complex running animations. On the initial dash, it's just Banjo throwing his entire body weight forward, but you don't even get to see him jog before Kazooie impatiently lifts Banjo up and hightails it with her legs. And it's all in one elegantly fluid motion. I love this animation. This move always really defined to me what Banjo and Kazooie was all about, changing up the leader in order to be most effective. And this move in Smash really shows just how unique they are. You can even notice the cartoony sliding effect when you turn around in your run, where Kazooie runs in place before taking off. And this move is adapted into the up tilt, where Kazooie pops Banjo up for a kick. This move plays right into the up special as well, the shock spring jump, where Kazooie rears up her legs and leaps into the air. This move also allows you to jump again, similarly to how it was used in Banjo. The other aerials in the package use Kazooie, which ironically pack far less of a wallop but are quick and easy attacks. Such as the up air using Kazooie's wings, being a reference to the Beak Bomb ability. Although it only references the part where Kazooie rears up before she launches her and Banjo. The wing whack from Banjo 2 is the source for the neutral aerial. And the Bill Drill. And while I wish it was Bill Trennan's staple dance move, this is Banjo Kazooie's up smash. Now in Banjo 2, it was used more as an extension of the Beak Buster, using it to drill bigger objects that that couldn't handle. But here they flip it to an upward drilling attack that has Banjo posing like a badass. And man, does the move feel as powerful as this pose. And the last of the moves are the other smashes. The Briegel Bash takes Kazooie and slams her into the ground, exactly as it appeared in Banjo-Tooie. She's just as impressed with it. And the Down Smash, uh, 
Poultritana copycat move? I'm sorry, I'll let myself out. It feels like there's a rare occurrence going on here, where DK, K. Rool, and now Banjo have moves that bury you into the ground, with Banjo's down throw no less, and their back throw. This is just my interpretation, but this is very similar to Mario's, reflecting how Banjo-Kazooie was very much inspired by Mario 64, which is the game where Mario's back throw is derived from. If it's not a nod, I think it's a very charming addition. Or it's the pack whack, but I like my idea better. Same could be said about Mario and Banjo's similar looking forward aerials. Although, I'm of the opinion that they copied Ganondorf's because that just makes me happier. This is just so satisfying to run off stage and go, yeah! Of course, there's a bunch of aesthetic stuff that the two critters lambast on the battlefield. So much so, it's hard to miss. Their taunts. One, as I said, is a reference to ba Then the taunt referencing this little celebratory animation when you get all the jiggies in a level, or you clear a note door total in Grunty's lair. The full version of this is used in Banjo's victory animation as well. Not to mention the voice line here taken from Banjo-Kazooie in all its compressed glory. Uh -huh. Another great touch to the moveset is all of the sounds are taken from the early Banjo games, with even some taken from Grunty's Revenge, which, now that I think about it, is the only time we've really heard these voice lines not filtered through a Game Boy Advance. And finally, this taunt. It's not related to anything! Now, for me, I believe the angles these two are at kind of reflects how they appear in their health icon in the Banjo games, with the two merrily looking at the camera unless they're dying. Imagine if their portrait changed when their percent went up in Smash, similar to how when he took damage in Banjo-Kazooie. I mean, they changed Joker, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. They enter the battle through a jiggy silhouette similar to the in-game transition in Banjo, as well as holding one in their victory screen, and having it as their series icon. And oh boy, what do alternate colors and Sonic games for the Wii have in common? Colors! Banjo-Kazooie take a host of their palette swaps from the many different lovable Banjo characters, Fun fact, these guys are alphabetically the first characters in the list of all ultimate characters. Uh, unless you count Alf. We don't. Banjo continues my ever-living quest to support the color pink with this reference to Mumbo Jumbo. He transforms you into different things in Banjo games and the color scheme really comes to life in Smash. Then, Bottles, our lord and savior. With Kazooie and her cotton candy colors referencing the multiplayer colors in Banjo-Tooie as well. This color closely resembles 2D's color scheme, but it also could be a reference to Conker. While Kazooie actually references a specific chained Brigo from Grunty's Revenge. Then Boggy, the worst father ever. And Kazooie simply representing a Gentoo penguin. Then Super Saiyan Banjo-Kazooie is what happens when you get all 7 Chaos Emeralds. Or another caution from Tui's multiplayer and Terry the Pterodactyl. Then Banjo-Kazooie simplifying their color palette to blue and red representing the game's logo color, but also the split pads in Banjo-Tooie. And my favorite, their grunty palette, representing the villain of the whole damn series. And finally, the final smash, simply representing the final battle against Gruntilda in the first game with the mighty Ginginator. Man, it's just so goofy. This thing doesn't make any damn sense. Like, when you're playing the game, you're not gonna think that this is going to be the last delivering blow, but of course it is. This thing knocks Gruntilda off of her lair, crushing her under a boulder. <laughs> Since Cory the Boulder did not make an appearance in the final Smash, my review score for this character has dropped significantly. However, the amount of charm packed into Banjo and Kazooie is just amazing. As a fan of the series, you can tell it was integral for them to make sure that that matched their appearance from the core games. And under the surface, there was a lot that went into that. The inclusion of Banjo Kazooie was more obvious than making a product out of the dough between donuts. Well, in the trash they go. But first, I want to mention all the core parts of what gave the Banjo-Kazooie games their identity. The interchange between moves to change between speed and power is straight up a mechanic in Banjo-Tooie, and it's more passive within the first game. Not to mention the cavalcade of references to the many abilities and inventory items you have. And overall, the two depict their personalities perfectly. They're very subtle, but I implore you, take a look in training mode at some of their moves. Kazooie always looks like she's about to throw hands and Banjo's just happy to be here. This also goes for their general style of being animated. Banjo and Kazooie wear their personality on their body like if they shopped at Hot Topic. Every move of theirs isn't just a punch and a kick, it's grossly exaggerated. But let's compare them to say how Bayonetta's attacks look. They're fluid, proportional, sexy. But Banjo's utilized many aspects of early 3D game animation before games started looking a bit too real. The size of his limbs grow for powerful attacks. Their bodies shrink and stretch to communicate weight and speed. Banjo is heavy and sinks like a rock, but Kazooie's attacks feel sharp and pecky like a woodpecker. This extends to every action and hit animation, being extremely slapstick overselling the impact. Look at the two of them when they take a big hit. None of this, oh, that hurt a lot. It looks like their lives are flashing before their eyes when they get hit. Their triple jump is one of my favorite animations. You see Kazooie pop out, pulling the bag upward with Banjo only holding on by the straps. And their victory, it, it just pops and it's so mesmerizing. 
Why is this the case though? It's because the Banjo-Kazooie games have a lot more Western animation influence. I did mention Looney Tunes and that wasn't just a stray reference. This is very much depicting what a Hanna-Barbera game character would look like. And it's weird because the stretch and compressed goofiness of Smash Bros was kind of lost after 64. Like Bowser being footstooled is supposed to look cartoony, yet on this realistic Bowser model it looks very, very off. Compare that to the edge animation of these two, specifically reminding me of Wile E. Coyote. Banjo is on the edge running his legs in the air while Kazooie pops in and out to check it out. First squawking on stage at the opponent, probably insulting them. Then looking at the camera when Banjo doesn't look like he's gonna make it looking like she's saying, I should have stayed in college. All of this for a ledge animation. At the core, I think that's why these characters sort of feel right at home on this roster. They don't have a gimmick, and in fact, they feel like they could have been designed for Melee and still would have looked the same. Perhaps in a way, the team wanted to preserve the stylistic limitations of what they had during their series on the N64 to truly give them justice, which makes sense of their more simplistic moveset. Then all the bells and whistles thrown in to let them shine? Let's just say, I'm happy we didn't get them in Brawl and got the nuts and bolts model. I know car crashes I'd rather hang out with. And now I'm sad. You play Banjo-Kazooie, you play Banjo-Tooie, you play Banjo Pilot, and you got the whole series, that's it. Now, no more Banjo games. Yeah, the core members of Rare went on to work on ukulele and whatever platformer that is, I heard it's good, but there's a certain Banjo-Kazooie style platformer that is not getting met, and I feel that place empty in my heart. Thank you all for watching this Banjo-Kazooie Know Your Moves. Obviously, Joker, Banjo, I've been having a hot streak of characters I've wanted for a really long time and got to talk about them, so I'm pretty fulfilled. That said, Hero is not going to be next, okay? I actually want to play Dragon Quest XI, because I hear that is where a lot of the moves are from, and I don't want to do a hacky job of that. I could definitely do a hacky job of it, but there's a lot of fans of the Dragon Quest series, and I wouldn't want to do that, and I definitely would want to do the character justice, because, I mean, I'm a Akira Toriyama fan, so that's enough to get into it. I hope. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. This has been Alex, and I will see you on the flip side.